So today, this one's a little tough. Uh, we're going to deal with a passage uh, that has created a lot of confusion and even some difficulty for a lot of folks. Um, and before we really jump into it, I need to set up kind of the context to understand what's going on here. I think too often when we study the Bible, we pick out a text, you know, Matthew 12, 22 through 25 or something like that. And we study that text and forget that it's sitting in an entire book. Or we forget that the verse numbers and chapter numbers were added much, much later. So they weren't really divided up. It was just one continual text. In fact, in the Greek New Testament, it was all capital letters in Greek with no spaces, no paragraphs. It was just text. So, we, we need to look at the larger context of what's going on to understand maybe a troubling passage or a passage that we're having difficulty understanding. So, we said last time that we're in the third book of Matthew, specifically in chapters 11 and 12, which is the story or the narrative section of this opposition to Jesus. So, Jesus, after his kind of his popularity and doing miracles and teaching, now he's meeting opposition. And then we'll get into chapter 13, which he teaches kind of in the midst of this op opposition. So that's kind of where we are in the Gospel of Matthew. This story that we're going to get into, um, before we start, I also want to look at some assumptions that we make about God in general. One of those assumptions is that God must forgive. That We know that God does forgive, but we, a lot of folks believe that God has to forgive, that if we ask, God must forgive us. True or false? Well, actually, it's false. God does not have to forgive us. In fact, in Isaiah 59, it says this. This is in beginning in verse 1. See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ears too dull to hear. So God can hear, God can see, God can reach out to us. God's not too far away. But then it goes on. Rather, your iniquities or your sins have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face so that he does not hear. So God's not hearing our calls because of us. So God's not listening to us because of us. In Isaiah chapter 1, it says this, When you stretch out your hands, usually in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. So in Isaiah, what's going on is that people are doing wrong things. And because of the wrong things, God's not listening. God has turned away from them. So God can't hear their calls to, for, for forgiveness because he says he's not listening because of what they're doing. Even in Matthew 6, we went through the Lord's Prayer. And in there, it says that we are to forgive others as we have been forgiven. And then after that, Jesus says, if you do not forgive others their sins, then neither will God forgive our sins. So, God is not required to forgive. The second thing or the second assumption we make is that forgiveness is easy. That we can just, at the end of the day or before a meal, say, God, forgive me for my sins and thanks for the food and just kind of move on. Like, it's nothing to God. Well, that's not true. We talked about this as well. So if you remember, we said that in, this is in Matthew 8 and 9, when the, the miracles section, that there was these three miracles put together. Uh, Jesus stills a storm, which is power over nature. He then casts out demons, which is power over the supernature or supernatural. And then he realizes a paralyzed man. And when he does that, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And then kind of people freak out. Who, how, can he, how can he say that? Um, only God can forgive sins and so forth. But then Jesus goes on and he says, which is easier to say rise and walk or to say your sins are forgiven? 
But to show you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, then he says to the man, rise and walk, he gets up and walks. And the concept is, is that power of our nature is hard, power of the supernatural is harder, the power to forgive sins is the hardest. In fact, forgiving our sins cost Jesus his life. So no, forgiving sins is not easy. It costs God everything to forgive our sins. So that kind of forms a, a bit of a background to this section we're in in Matthew 12. Because we're going to get to a sin where Jesus says it's unforgivable. There's this one sin, Jesus says, that is unforgivable. And it's called the unforgivable sin. And it's really upset a lot of people because they think to themselves, wait a minute, what if I committed it? What if I have committed the unforgivable sin and therefore I'm kind of done? I'm toast. I, there's, there's no hope for me. I should just give up right now if I've committed this unforgivable sin. And therefore, what is the unforgivable sin? Well, we're going to get to that today in chapter 12. Um, again, context is everything. So what's going on in this particular passage where this unforgivable sin is mentioned by Jesus. Well, once again, Jesus is healing people. In this case, he heals a man who was mute and blind and possessed by a demon. So he's possessed by a demon, causing him to be mute, can't speak, and blind. And Jesus does what he does. He heals the man, and it says the crowds are amazed. And they say, can this be the son of David? Can this be the Messiah, the one we're expecting? So, again, a man is healed, which is a good thing. I mean, we can think all agree, I hope, that a man who is blind and mute and possessed is now set free and can see and speak. Okay. The crowds see it. They're amazed. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they see this, and they are concerned about Jesus' growing popularity, they're concerned about their power, they're concerned about their agenda and their control over the people. Their response is, well, hold on a minute. If Jesus casts out a demon, then maybe it's by the spirit of Beelzebul, Satan, that he casts out demons. So maybe the motivation for Jesus casting out demons is to show his power over the demons because he's in league with the demons. He uses the power of evil, of Satan, to do this. Is this attack on the miracle? No. There's no denying the fact that this man is mute and can speak, was blind and can see, was possessed and is set free. That, that's not in dispute here. The miracle was done. This man is healed. However, they're questioning Jesus' authority. And by the way, this behavior is not new. It goes on all the time. People look at facts, the same facts, and then they attach stories or agendas to those facts so that it can protect their own agenda going into the argument or going into analyzing or studying what happened. So um, John Polkinghorne had once said, is, is a physicist, who said, we all have spectacles behind our eyes. We have these agendas, these ways of seeing the world, and those often can color what we see as fact. Well, in this case, people see a miracle. Some say that's God working because it's doing good. Others say, well, wait a minute, maybe it's Satan working because we've got an agenda to protect. So let's take a look now at this text. We're in Matthew 12, verse 25. He knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So Jesus is going to respond to them calling his miracle as an act of the devil by giving out some kind of logical arguments. And the first argument is this. How in the world... Can Satan's kingdom stand if it's divided against itself? Why would Satan cast out a demon and just divide his own house? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. How does that further his agenda? So logically, it wouldn't make any sense that Satan would cast out a demon. Second argument he makes is this, verse 27. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, Satan, by whom do your own exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But... 
If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. So two important points here. First, again, very simple logic. Jesus says, how do you people cast out demons? By God? Then why would you think I would do that any differently? So they'll be your judges. So again, he's just being very logical in how he approaches them. He's not getting angry, just kind of pointing out kind of the hypocrisy, I guess, in what they're saying. The second part is very, very important. How does Jesus cure this man? It's not his sparkling personality or his own power. What he says is, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, God is doing this. God's Spirit is doing this. If I do this by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come here. Go back to the Lord's Prayer. What is the third petition of that prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that God's kingdom in the second and third petition comes here. Well, we see that here, that if he casts out demons by the Spirit of God, then God's kingdom is here. Okay, now he gives a third argument, verse 29. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man? Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Jesus is saying here, I can't go and cast out a demon if the spirit by which I cast the demon out is not more powerful. Right? Only something that's more powerful than evil can cast out evil. Again, a very simple, logical argument. Now, does that do any good? Finding the truth was never their point. Knowing the facts and making decisions based on those facts and that logic was never their point. They were trying to push an agenda. They were trying to protect their power and their influence. And in doing so, they look at something that is clearly good. This man being healed. And they attribute it to the work of Satan. They attack the authority of Jesus. They attack the authority of God. Nothing else mattered. Not logic, not reason, not this man being set free. Only their agenda mattered. Now, once we kind of establish that and their perspective on what they're seeing, we then can take a look at this kind of terrifying text, if you will, in Matthew 12, 31. Let's take a look. Therefore, I tell you, people will be forgiven of every sin and blaspheme, but blaspheme against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. So you can see why folks are asking, well, have I done this? Have I blasphemed against the Holy Spirit? Have I spoken against the Holy Spirit? Because it says clearly right here, I will not be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Well, we need to ask And what's been asked is, what is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? Well, again, Jesus is saying this in a context of what's been going on in this larger story. These Pharisees, these religious leaders, were doing just that. They were looking at good, a man being set free from a demon, who was blind, who can now see, mute, who can now speak. They're seeing all this, and because of their agenda, we're attributing those actions to the devil to Satan. So what the Spirit had done, they gave credit for that action to Satan. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on. So why would it be unforgivable? And that's the other side of this question. I mean, we kind of know what it is. It's when you see, when you can't see good as good anymore, when you see good as somehow related to evil because of your own inner darkness, your own agenda, your own perspective, um, why would that be unforgivable? Well, why is God unable to forgive that sin? Well, I don't think it's a matter of power or inability. I think what's going on here is that if you're to the point of your own agenda or your perspective that you can no longer see good as inherently good, as see good as coming from God, then let me ask you this question. Who do you go to? To be forgiven for sin. Like, who do you ask 
to be forgiven because the God you've created is not the God of the Bible, the God of the universe, the Father of Jesus, the Spirit, all together. Who are you going to? Are you going to Satan to ask for forgiveness of sins? Because you're attributing the works of God to Satan. You're going to the wrong place. So maybe the reason that it's unforgivable is because they've lost sight of who God even is. They no longer see God as God. And we know folks like this who can become so blinded by their agenda, their perspective, how they want to see the world, that they shut out everything that comes from God or reassign it or give it a new agenda or give it a new um, perspective, that they stop seeing God as God and have created God in their image or in the image of their agenda, their perspective. Now, before before I go too far, let me remind you of something. This story is in the Bible, not just to take a knock at the Pharisees or to show what they did wrong. I think it's also here in Matthew to warn us, as Jesus' followers, not to do the same thing. We can be just as guilty as they are of looking at the world and creating our own spectacles behind the eyes, our own perspective, our own agendas, that we become so blind about the way we want things to be or what what we want, or how we want to see the world become so blinded by those things that we begin to create our own God. And if we do that, then where do we go to forgiveness? Go go to for forgiveness. Because it's no longer Jesus. It's no longer the Spirit of God. We're going to this creation that we've made ourselves because we're trying to protect our position or our power or our possessions. We're so attracted to those things that we no longer see Good is good. We no longer see good as coming from God. And then we lose track of God altogether. So how do we avoid committing the unforgivable sin? It's simple. Continue to do good. Look to the Bible. Pray. Get to know God more deeply so that we know what good is. And we go and do those things. Jesus starts this whole story by doing good. He goes and sees a need, a man who is possessed, blind, and uh, can't speak, and he heals that man. He does good. If we're doing good in the name of God and doing the good that is defined by God, we begin moving ourselves closer in our, in our walk, and our relationship with God. So look for those places where you can do good today, where you can show compassion and love and mercy, and concern for other people the way Jesus did. We are called to be disciples and followers, to do good before the day ends. 